Hallelujah. Let's turn to the book of the Revelation, chapter 2. And we're talking about knowing the depths of Satan. Distractions and interruptions. Chapter 2, verse 18. And to the angel of the church of Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works in charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works in the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou hast suffered the woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit adultery, to commit fornication, to commit illicit sexual sins, and to eat things sacrificed to idols. He goes on to say that I gave her space to repent. She did repent. So he goes on and says in verse 24, to the people that are there that were deceived because they unknowingly were deceived, and I've got to kind of figure that out for you a little later on, that uh, unto you and, and the rest of our time, verse 24, as many as have not this doctrine, you didn't buy into that, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put none of other burden on you. So Jesus is being merciful, and he's been merciful to people that were in this environment, but it didn't get in them. They really didn't actually know what was going on, or they were young, or they were babes, or whatever the issue was. Jesus is showing mercy here. He said, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to, to judge the entire church of Thyatira. You know what I mean? The ones that didn't repent, but the entire church knows. So some people, he said, I'm not going to put that burden on you. So this is what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about, and I left off last week, talking about the depths of Satan. And one of the things you need to understand about the depths of Satan, it doesn't mean that Satan is deep. The depths have to, have to do with the length and the depth and how, how, he, how far he'll go to convince you that he's God. That's, how, that's what I mean. How far he'll go to convince you that he's God. Okay. Now, you know, we've seen Satan that in his red leggings <laughs> and jogging suits and red, you know, uh, what do you call it? Yoga pants, whatever you want to call them. Horns, pitchfork, cloven foot walking around. And all that stems from Greek mythology. And that's some Greek mythology based upon some god that they worship, which was like the god Pan. The word Pan means everything and all things. Pan, like you pan an audience, mean catch all everybody, or pan, which means pantheism, which means all God. So pantheism believes that everything is God. You, me, the birds, the trees, this is God, the planet is God, everything. So pantheism worships everything. Pantheism worships the creation. Pantheism worships uh, inventions. Pantheism worships. So pan God it's an ancient god. It's a religious god. And listen to this. In, in Greek mythology, it was the god of the shepherds and the flocks, which goes very, very deep into God's area and territory of being the chief shepherd. Jesus is the chief shepherd. He's also known as the god of the underworld. The pitchfork has to uh, address, addresses the underworld. Sometimes there are artist depictions of what they think Satan looks like or the devil looks like. And the reason it's so varying is to confuse people and to dilute or water down the real story of the real truth behind who he really is. So the truth behind who he really is. And so that's one thing that we have to understand. Go to 2 Thessalonians for just a moment. And then I want to go to Isaiah and Ezekiel. We haven't been there for a while. And we'll look at um, something. Hopefully we can do it pretty quick. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is a um, real important text in the New Testament. And why do I say that? Because the Apostle Paul 
as a writer and a revealer of the truth of God. In the book of the Revelation, we see things that Paul taught or alluded to in his epistles. Now, Paul writing to the churches helped us to identify with the resurrection and the redemption and that we're ambassadors and that our life is in Christ and all the letters he wrote to these churches to identify who we were in Christ. But he brought another revelation to the church. The other revelation he brought to the church is the depths of Satan. Now, he didn't use those words exactly, but he warned us again and again and again and again and again, showing us that there's something going on out there that you don't see, that there's a warfare that wages in the spiritual realm going on all the time. Okay, but these are fierce battles and forces that try to disrupt the will of God. So everything he describes, he doesn't always say the word Satan or, 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 or the devil. He tells you about the activity and the action, you know. And that's why he tells us, and go to 2 Corinthians now, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we'll go back to 1 Thessalonians. I'm going to go back to 2 Thessalonians. I want you to see this. That's why he says... In verse 13, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, for such are, let's see, okay, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Okay, so this is what we're talking about, being transformed into an angel of light. Uh, his ministers transformed to angels of light. A false apostles, or false prophets. See, in other words, he'll use men to promulgate his truth. Now, what is his truth? That's where we got to go back to Second Thessalonians. Now, sorry about that. His truth is that he's God. He really believes that he's God, that he wins. That's the depth of Satan. It's the depth of his own deception. His own deception. Now look here, and in verse, um, verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, that talks about the way, the, the calling out of believers and gathering together, coming together, could be talking about the rapture, or also the day when there's just a lot of apostasy as we see today. Okay, okay. That you be not, verse 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Let me read that again. That's the depth is how deceived he is, and he teaches, and what comes through his prophets and apostles and priests or whomever is connected to his satanic priesthood will preach the same thing. And that's why we have so many different religions, we've got so many secret, secret orders and secret societies and all that kind of stuff, that at the end game, their end game, that the ultimate end game is that Satan or Lucifer is God. Okay, let's look at this verse again. Verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship so that he, this is what's so powerful, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, and this is what's so deep, showing himself, showing himself, showing himself. It didn't even say that he's going to get everybody to believe it, but he believes it. Showing himself what? That he is God. Okay, let's go to Isaiah 14. In Isaiah chapter 14, we're going to read something here. Now, you got to be mindful that there is a dark prince or dark ruler behind the leaders of nations. 
not every century, not every generation, not every decade, but there is one. So what the Lord would do, he would speak to that leader, to the king of Babylon, or the uh, king of Tyre, but he would be dealing with the spirit that energizes and influences them. He's dealing with a spirit that these leaders are obeying. How do you know? You know that these leaders, the leaders of these nations, are obeying a satanic spirit or influence by their decisions, by what they're doing, by their worship, by, and lack thereof, okay? So in Isaiah chapter 14, some people will say, well, this is not referring to uh, Satan or Lucifer because this is referring to the king of Babylon. Well, God is speaking to the spirit behind the king of Babylon. So let's read this anyhow, okay? And I want to go to verse 12. And it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high God. Now, this is not something where God, by his spirit, is speaking to the king of Babylon. Because he says, he tells you who he's talking to. He said, how have I fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Now, the thing we need to understand is that when you look at the word Lucifer, be careful. When you look at the word Lucifer, the name Lucifer, you can look up the meaning of a name, what the name means, or how the name is in Greek, how it's in Aramaic, how it is in, in Hebrew or whatever. And then sometimes it gives you multiple choices or different choices as to what it means in a different language, okay? But he says here, he calls this person, the spirit behind him, Lucifer. Now somebody will say that Satan's, one of Satan's name is not Lucifer. He has a lot of names and a lot of titles, okay? But this here describes someone who says, I will ascend, I will sit, I will be like the Most High, I will exalt, and I will be like the Most High, and I will sit, and I will be like the Most High, I will sit. In other words, he's exalted himself, okay? Now, another example of this, and I want you to be very mindful of Son of the Morning. When you read different translations, now I'm reading from the King James. If you're reading from the NIV, which is New International Version, or the NASB, New American Standard Bible, or you're reading from the ESV, or you're reading from any of the other translations, they may refer to how art thy fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, O bright and morning star. Lucifer is not the bright and morning star. Jesus is the bright and morning star. And so a lot of the modern translations can trip you up if you don't already know this. If you know it, you just read above it and you just keep on reading because you know that Lucifer is called here son of the morning. And when you look up the name uh, Halal, Halal, not Halal like hallelujah, or if it means, uh, uh, what do you mean, uh, light bearer, well, then we understand what his role was, so we can read that in the book of Ezekiel 28, when God was speaking to the demonic prince behind this nation, this other nation, okay? And so it's important. If we don't get that, we will miss it. We will miss what God is saying entirely and who he's identifying here as the son of the morning, not great and morning star, where Jesus refers to himself. How do you understand what I mean? How many of your Bibles refer to him as the bright morning star? Oh, Y'all must be King James people like me. Now, now, King James doesn't mean that King... Listen, King James was a trip. King, King James, James, right now if he was here, he'd be celebrating Pride Month, okay? But he was the king. And he was the one that gave the order and gave the... Uh, edic that to write, to, to, to call these leaders together and these writers and scribes together to present him a, the Bible, okay? So he had to give the permission, like there's certain things the president has to give an uh, executive order. It was kind of like an executive order, you do this. That doesn't mean that King James was worship God. He didn't worship God. It doesn't really mean that King James was holy. He wasn't holy and pure. He was a very, very confused young man, okay? However... 
however. But to understand that a lot of the modern translations, they go through subtle, subtle, subtle depths to deceive and minimize who Jesus is, minimize the Christ, minimize the word holy, minimize the word godly, minimize where it says that we are in Christ, minimize and juggle the terms of Jesus around with the terms and title for Satan. And this is one of those times. He is not the bright morning star, son of the morning. He's not creator. He's not a father. He's a created angelic being who fell. Okay, are you guys still with me? Okay, now go with me in a hurry. Go to Ezekiel 28. I got to lay this foundation before I get into the message today, which I'm excited about. But I still got to make sure that people that don't know get the basics. My church knows this stuff. Okay. Okay. Now, let's look at Ezekiel 28. Now, again, the word of the Lord, look at verse 1. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, Because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am God. I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas. Yet thou art a man, and not God. So you know he's not talking about here the king itself. He said, but you, 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 but you are what? You are not a man. He know he's dealing with the spirit behind the man. Thou art a man. Thou art a man. Tyler talked about the, to the prince of Tyrus that thou art a man. He says, you're not God. You're not God. That's what I should have said. Though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Then he's talked about how his, he trafficked. He trafficked riches and he traffics uh, all kinds of things that would lift him up and that would wear the people down or cause the people not to worship God. I'm going to slip over here and I'm going to go to verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the psalm full of wisdom and perfect and beauty. Thou hast been in Eden. Now this is important, okay? Now you know the prince of Tyre had been in Eden. That was thousands of years before. He hadn't lived that long. So whoever this was was a spirit being because he had been in where? You have been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius and topaz and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and the and gold. The workman of thy tab rays and of thy pipes was prepared in thee the day that thou was created. So this is a created being, not the creator. You are not God. You see yourself as God. You are a create Lucifer, Satan, whatever you call yourself today, you were created. Okay. And then it says, thou art the anointed cherub. Okay. Anointed means cherub is a type of angel. Cherubim is plural. Cherub is singular. So you are anointed cherub that covereth. That means whatever his role was in heaven, it was a leading one. He was a covering cherub. That he had authority. He had been given some type of rule. And he says, and I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was what? Created and Till what? Iniquity, iniquity was found in thee. And then we go ahead and we read, and he also is tied to trafficking. So here we're saying that his heart was lifted up. Well, let me tell you something. I know this is Pride Month, but you need to ever understand that anything that has to do with pride in the Bible is a stench in the nostrils of God. I said in the Bible, maybe not in the White House. And maybe not in Sacramento, maybe not, but to God, he said pride coming for destruction. And I believe that that's prophetic. Even though it's a proverb, I believe it's a prophetic because pride cometh before destruction. There's a lot of things that are yet to happen because of pride. Because when man gets so lifted up, so both of these kings got so lifted up, God's speaking to the spirit behind them, and he's telling us the spirit behind them is the devil. 
So I'm talking about how the depths that Satan will go to preach and teach and fill himself with false prophets and apostles and teachers and Jezebel spirits, men or women, Jezebel, who call themselves prophetess, to teach and to seduce. Seduce what? To teach that God is not God, but to teach that Lucifer is God. Your Satanists, your Masons, and a whole lot of other organizations, when you get to the end and find out who they really, 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 really are, you will find the doctrine of Jezebel. Yes. The teaching, seducing spirit. I hope you're still with me. So he said, I am God. I sit in the seat of God. You sit in the seat of God. You have been a trafficker, and God says, I'm going to bring you down to the lowest. I'm going to bring you back down to the pit. I'm going to bring you down from where you came from. So he's speaking here, okay? And what's so important about these two areas is that we're dealing with the verse in 2 Corinthians 11 that says transform, that, that, that he, Satan can transform himself, okay? Now, some people have a challenge by using the word, uh, between using the word Satan and, 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 and the devil and all that, and they say, well, he's, he's not all that. Well, he, yeah, he's not. He's not a big thing, but don't you get it twisted. He's nothing. He's no joke. You don't play with him, okay? You don't play with him, okay? Why not? Because he's able to transform himself into an angel of light. Okay, in doing that, he's able to be so deceptive, and you see that in life. And I want to talk to you about life, just some street sense today, of how people who appear to be one thing, but they're really something else. How God says that I don't look on the outward appearance, I look at a man's heart. Man looks on the outward appearance. And looking on the outward appearance without deserving means that you and I have been tuh, deceived. If you only look at a person on their outward appearance. And so one of the things about that word transform means, remember the Bible says that we need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Okay. If you're not transformed by the renewing of your mind, you'll never recognize someone who has been transformed into an angel of light. You got to commit to your own personal transformation by the renewing of your mind. Okay. Because we're looking at here, even this God, the pan, was supposed to be able to transform himself, transport, which has to do with, uh, uh, um, you know, what do you call it? Projection, astral projection, teleport, and had to had enormous strength. But in this life, in this culture, we see nothing but presenting. We need to see nothing but evil presenting itself as good. And because evil presents itself as good, people, the masses are confused and deceived. And when the masses are confused and deceived, they don't even know, or they have no idea who they're worshiping. Until you get to the end of the road, when I come to the end of the road, you're going to find out at the end of the road that you've been following the wrong person. And you got people sitting in hundreds of churches, thousands, millions of churches around the world that are like these people in fire tire. They didn't, they, didn't know, they didn't know what she was teaching. They didn't know uh, Satan. They didn't know who he was. They didn't know the depths of Satan, which is to be able to go as low as he can, to bring himself up high as he can to prove that he's God. See, Timothy, Paul writing to Timothy, and he said this, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And I wrote this down, pay attention. He said, but evil men and seducers. Now, that's not even demons. Those are evil men and seducers who are influenced by demonic authority and demonic powers. He said it's going to get worse. He said it's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse and deceiving and being deceived. So that lets me know that a lot of people who are caught under this uh, spell because it's form of witchcraft too are being deceived. And so deceive can mean when a person conceals something, you look at the depths of Satan and the, the fork and the pitchfork and all that kind of stuff. He hides his mask, you know, a cover-up. He can make something look like it's not. And so that's important that we understand. See, one of the things about being a sinner, one of the advantages of being a sinner, now I don't believe I'm saying there's an advantage to being a sinner. Okay, y'all just stick with me now. One of the advantages of being a sinner and knowing darkness it makes you appreciate the light. Yes, yes, yes. Can I say it that way? Because when you've been out there in this confusion and mess, 
it makes you appreciate the light and you come to know the light, the light better. Because the enemy is the master of disguises. Yes, yes, yes. And you and your life and my life know that every time you deceive, got deceived, you fell into a bad relationship, you got a bad money job, you know, an investment. It was always something that sounded really good. It sounded too good to be true. And guess what? It was. And you didn't win it and lost your home, you didn't lost your, your morals, you lost your wife, lost your family, lost everything because you didn't know you were being deceived. See, all that glitters is not gold. And so Paul is telling us, he's telling the church of Corinth, you know, you, you know he, in fact, he says, no marvel, no marvel. The NIV version says, no wonder. No, 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 no. That's not strong enough. No wonder. Satan can transform himself. Not no wonder. No Marvel. And I thought about the Marvel comics. When I talk about an angel of light and all these superheroes and all this kind of stuff, okay? One story in the book of 1 Kings chapter 22. You can go there, but I'm just going to quote it mostly. And that has to do with Jehoshaphat, who was the king of Judah, and Ahab, who was the king of Israel. Okay, and Ahab comes to king of Judah and says he wants him to go to war with him against the Syrians. And Jehoshaphat agrees to do it. So Ahab has this big plan and everything. Then Jehoshaphat says to Ahab, these two kings talking, he said, well, uh, 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 let's inquire. And so, so Ahab brings up all these 400 prophets, but they're all false prophets. 400 prophets, and they all prophesied to him. Yes, you shall go. You shall prevail. All the good prophecies that you hear today, you're going to prosper. You're going to have a big ministry. You're going to have a handsome husband. Prophesy, prosper, 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 prosper. Told him he's going to prosper. Told him what he wanted to hear. All the other false prophets told him what he wanted to hear. And Ahab loved that. But then uh, Jehoshaphat said, isn't here another prophet? Is there someone else we can talk to? And Ahab, like a brat, like a kid, because remember, he was married to the real Jezebel. And he was a punk. And he said, oh, God, he never prophesied anything good to me. I, don't, I hate him. A fool. You know, and so he told him to go get him in hell. So they went and got Micaiah, Micaiah, who was in prison for prophesying, okay? And so the false prophets had said, you know, for Jehoshaphat, I mean, to Ahab, to go ahead and attack, attack. You will prevail. And they even said, the sovereign one says. So that's like they're quoting the God, the sovereign one. So that would make you think there's somebody who's prophesying because they use the right language. And that's like a lot of the modern day translations. They use the right language and it'll throw you off, the sovereign one, okay? And it says that all the prophets, uh, all the prophets prophesied that he should go. You know what I mean? And then when they were bringing Micaiah down, they said, okay, now all the prophets had told the king to go, so be cool, man. You know, don't, don't mess it up. You're the only one that comes in and you mess up things, you know. So Micaiah said, okay. So they brought him before the kings, and the kings had hung their robes in a particular place. So that's a very important key when you read this chapter. And so, so they said, well, Micaiah, what is the Lord saying? And so Micaiah said, but the other prophet said, well, you should go, and, you know, you will prevail. And Ahab says, you never tell me anything good. That's not what he said. So, so Micaiah said, you really want to know? This is what I saw. I saw God sitting on his throne. And I saw the council of his throne, and the host of heaven was standing, oh gosh, <laughs> and the host of heaven was standing around him. You got to see this part. Go to First Kings. I can't, I can't, I, this, I can't do this justice. And the host of heaven, and the host of heaven, you got to understand that we're dealing with God in a mighty way, the host of heaven. Well, who is the host of heaven? That's all the angels, all types of angels. Who is the host of heaven? That is all of creation in the heavens, the stars and the moon, I mean the stars and the planets. You better understand, when God goes to war, he brings all his arsenal. He said, the, 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 the heavens, okay? And then he says, look, I'm trying to get to uh, 1 Kings 22, because I laid that foundation, it's eating to my time. Okay, okay, okay. And this was, he said, look at verse, uh, verse 10, verse 9. Then the king of Israel, 1 Kings 22, 9. Then the king of Israel called an, an officer and said, Hasten hither, Micaiah, the son of Imlah. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, sat each on his throne, having put on their robes in a void place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria. Samaria. Now all the prophets prophesied before them. And Zedekiah, the son of Shaniah, made him horns 
of iron. Now, this is what you call a prophetic demonstration, a prophetic imagery. So you got one prophet that made a horn of iron and brought it to the king Ahab and presented to him and said, "These with these shall I push the Iranians until you have consumed them. And verse 12, again, all the prophets prophesied, saying, go ahead and what? Prosper. I want you to understand that that's a word. You need to be, be mindful of the word. I want you to prosper. God says, I, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prosper. God wants you to excel, wants you to prosper. But if somebody can hold out a carrot in front of you and give you some gain and promise you prosperity that they don't have, they ain't got no money themselves. They ain't got nothing. They promise you something. Okay, so be careful of that. Okay, that's a deception. Okay, in verse 13, and the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, Behold, now the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth. So I'm going to go on down. Okay, so Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, I will preach the right thing. And then he says this in verse 15. So he came to the king, and the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And he answered him, Go and prosper. For the Lord shall deliver it into the, to thine hand. And the king said unto him, How many times shall I jeer thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? He was just so tripping. And he said, I saw. Then this is what he told him. I saw. This is Micaiah. I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell thee? that he would prophesy no good concerning but evil. And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? In other words, fail, be killed, whatever. You ain't winning this one. And one said, on this manner, and another said on that manner. They got really, you know, they were just going back and forth. And then there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade. And the Lord said unto him, wherewith or how? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, thou shalt persuade him and prevail. Go forth. So the spirit came up. He said, he was a God said, yeah, you shall persuade him. Go forth. But as one spirit, he said that I will be a lying prophet. I will be spirit of lying. What does it say? I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. So all of them are lying. All of them were lying. Okay. Then it says here, now therefore behold, the Lord had put line spirit. Okay, I'm taking too much time on this. So this is how you see the setup. So this is how the setup goes. So they get ready to go to battle. They get to enter into the battle, okay? But now Ahab has a plan. So he says in verse 30, and the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself. That's what we're talking about. All that it shines is not gold. Look behind you. Don't see, you know, Satan is a disguiser, a deceiver. But he says, I will disguise myself. Okay. He told Jehoshaphat this, and enter into the battle. But put thou on thy robe. I'm going to disguise myself, but you wear your robe. I'm going to disguise myself so they won't know who I am. But put on your robe. So when they get to battle, they'll only, be, they'll only see one king. And the plan was in, in Ahab's mind to set you up. You ever been set up? You ever been set up? It's the same kind of thing, just manipulation. Okay. And he says, but you put on thy robes. Okay. <laughs> and the king of Israel disguised himself and went into the battle. So Ahab went into the battle disguised. He didn't go as, he wasn't in his royalty. He wasn't in his array. He wasn't the normal thing that they would know this is the king. Okay. And so what happens? What Ahab is trying to do is circumvent the prophet and the prophecy of the living God that told him you're going to die in battle. Now, sometimes God told us, if you don't change, you're going to die. How many know what I'm talking about? If you don't change, you're going to die. If you don't change, you're going to die. And they would say, oh, my God, poor people, get off of that stuff. That's between them and God. You don't know how God's been dealing with them. You don't know how many times they, you know, rejected God, and they cursed on God, and God's still coming trying to save their ignorant soul. You know, you don't know. You got to understand that God, how he dealt with you, how he deals with other people. So what happens? They get out in battle. 
and they get up to Jehoshaphat, and they're about to kill Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat screams, and they say, that's not the king of Israel. You know, and they let Jehoshaphat go. And he had already told him, he had told his men, the Syrian army, it says, all 32 of his men, it says, I want you to, don't worry about the, about the small and the great, go after the king of Israel. That's the one I want. And they went through that battle until they got to the king of Israel and smote Ahab. And that's how Ahab ended up dying. How did he end up dying? Because he thought that he could deceive people with a disguise. You know, people think you can deceive the Holy Ghost with a disguise. See, the depths of Satan lets us know that he is deceived. He's so deceived, he would even disguise himself, you know, because of you and me, because he doesn't want us to know who we are. A lying spirit is still prevalent today in the mouth of prophets. So the Bible says that the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not. So this is important to understand. Satan transformed himself in an angel of light. Okay, There is a light that blinds. And it's not what Ananias experienced on the road to Damascus. On the road to Damascus in Acts 9, and uh, not Ananias, Paul, 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 Paul on the road to Damascus, okay, saw this bright light. He couldn't see for three days because of that light, okay? But we find out later on that that light was the glory, the glory of God. And sometimes when you're in the glory, there's things you can't see because it's the glory of God. But there is a way that Satan blinds people that they cannot see. And I'm not even talking about visual where you can't see visually, but it's the kind of blindness that lacks understanding and perception. It's the kind of blindness that, that doesn't allow a person to think, where you're deprived of all the things that you need to know to make the right decision. The Holy Spirit tries to warn us sometime before you jump into bed, before you go back to the gambling table, and before you take another hit warning us all the time love is pricking and warning and pricking and warning us but we all go against that we override that we override that because the blinded minds when a mind is blinded okay and they can't see they have no judgment no reason no discernment when you're walking in the light as he is the light and that light also means illumination and understanding you know then we have fellowship with God we have fellowship with one another and then things are revealed exposed and uncovered and you're able to see the spirit behind the person that you're dealing with. How many of you understand what I'm saying? You know, that thing is exposed. That thing is, is, is revealed to you, uncovered. Okay. See, there's a scripture Paul writing the Church of Carmen says that uh, 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 the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. So we're impressed with the web and the internet and all the technology. We're impressed with technology. You know, I am to some degree, but I'm not more impressed with technology than I am God because God says the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. So you got a machine and you got a, you got a battery this big and you got a phone this big. God, that, God said, all I got to do is speak it. I, ain't, I, have, I don't even have to have anything material. You have to have a material instrument to work through it based upon the powers that I put in the atmosphere and the currents and the frequencies I put in the atmosphere and all that I put in the atmosphere and the sky so you can even get a satellite up there. See, God is so much more than that. So when, when, when people have been blinded, they're unable and sometimes unwilling to understand and discern the truth behind the true picture. And that is that doctrine of Jezebel. And that is where Satan says, I, I myself, I see myself as God. The depth and lack of his understanding is amazing. It's amazing because he really believes, he really believes that he can deceive people and he's deceiving the masses. People, right, right in our face we see prophecy being fulfilled. Right in our face we see stuff, but we don't. People won't acknowledge. Right in our face you can see what's happening in the community. You see what's happening. But you'd rather, you know, talk about whatever else and Illuminati and all that kind of stuff and, you know, who's, who's going to be at the BET Awards and all that kind of crap. Whatever. But God cautions us against that type of thing. Because, see, people who are dissatisfied with their life, like you're tired in your marriage and the grass looks green on the other side and you could have done better. You should have waited for somebody better to come along. And you're tired of your wife because, you, you know, you think now you could have been better. You know what I mean? And now you think, girl, you could have done better. I didn't have to marry him. And, you know, I, I, I miss God because I could have got somebody better. All y'all tripping. 
Because what's this 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 dissatisfaction will bring you is that attitude. You think you could have done better. And then you stop working at your own marriage. Then you stop working at your own. You stop working at it. You stop putting the time in. You stop putting the energy in to make it what it's supposed to be because now you have already thought to yourself, the grass is green on the other side. That's the disguise of the deception. Something that appears to be what it's not. You know, if you start watering the grass, if you start watering the grass where you're standing, if you start watering that grass, maybe that would get green too. But since you're not watering it, and you're standing in it with your negative stuff, talking about, oh, I wish I had that. I wish they got a bigger car. Oh, they got a bigger house. Oh, they got a bigger church. You know, no, no, no. You know, I caution against this dissatisfaction. And sometimes people are not satisfied with your own life. Find something in your life where you'll be satisfied. Okay, I'm satisfied being a Christian. If you've got to start being satisfied being a Christian, I'm satisfied being a mother. I'm satisfied. Are you understanding? How many understand what I'm saying? Enjoy yourself, like yourself. I'm satisfied. This, I'm satisfied so that the enemy cannot get in and tell you you can't get no satisfaction. We need to expose, reveal, and unmask. And unmask. Okay, the things that are going on because there's a ruthless nature. There's a ruthless nature that wa works through the outward show of innocence. Very ruthless. Very ruthless. In the latter days, you're going to see the devil using more children because of their innocence or because of their appearing to be innocent. We have a responsibility to pour and train our children, okay? Now, oh, whoa, 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 where was that scripture I was going to give you? Okay, I may not be able to turn to it, turn to it next week. Jesus says, he says that you got to be false prophets, you got to be aware of them, because they're like wolves in sheep's clothing. Always a deception. Wolves in sheep's clothing, okay? And so one of the things about wolves is they educate their young. And so there might be a pack of wolves. You can take a pack of wolves and you're so tired. You've been fighting and binding and loosening and pleading the blood and praying and crying and pleading the blood. But let me tell you, they've trained their little ones to come after you. Because they educate their young. They're keen. They have a keen sense of understanding, of depth. They have a strong sense of family and unity. They're devoted to their family. And they will come after you. So Jesus warns us. He says, I send you as sheep amongst wolves. And that's why he wants us to be discerning and understand the depths of Satan and how far he'll go to deceive you religiously. And we were talking yesterday at the men's, men's uh, fellowship, which I enjoyed. It was so good. Good being the old, I was the only girl, but anyhow, I stayed a little while. But I love those guys. So, so good. Sitting around, they were imagining that there was a barbecue pit over there. And that it had stakes on it. And I tried to look and see if I could see what they saw. But I couldn't. But we will. The day is coming. I love these guys, I'm telling you, okay? But understanding deception and, and being deceived. And so Jesus says that I send you as sheep among wolves. Now, sheep appear to be, we're helpless and defenseless. Wolves are fierce. They're, they're ferocious. You know, even their growl is frightening. A sheep, eh, and that's what sheep sound like. But the difference between the human sheep and, 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 and spiritual sheep is we have the chief shepherd. And when you get into a situation, even though the wolf, how many know you've had a wolf coming after you? You know, your supervisor, wolf personality, all this kind of stuff, crazy, crazy stuff. And that's exactly what it was. But God said, he says, he says, I warn you, you know, they that be with us are more than they that be with them, you know. And so don't trust everything that you see. Don't trust everything that you see. You cannot trust everything that you see. You cannot trust, okay. God says that the external appearance is not reliable indication of what's going on in the nature of that thing or the nature of that person. You young people, single people, you got to know somebody long enough to try to find out what their nature and what their character is. If you say you just get attracted to somebody, you're going to marry somebody just because you're attracted to them. You're going to sleep with somebody just because you're attracted to them. And you were attracted to them. They were very handsome. She was very pretty and all that kind of stuff. And you ended up with age. You ended up with syphilis. 
You didn't saw, you didn't know it was a negative outcome. The enemy just, you know, she, you, you just have to, you had to have her. You just had to sleep with him. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Don't get quiet on me up in here. And then you ended up with what? Something that you did not want. Why? Because you let your, your eyes, your eyes attract you to something and you didn't really look at the little pitchfork, okay? It's kind of like wolves in sheep's, sheep's clothing were like Little Red. Was it Little Red Riding Hood that the wolf deceived her? Was it Little Red Riding Hood? And she was skipping along, got a little basket with her little food, get back there. And the wolf, it just looked like a wolf, but, you know, but had on the red cape and the whole deal. You know, wolf in sheep's clothing. So you got to be careful. You got to be careful because we came from a place of hostility toward God. And because we came from a place of hostility and animos an animosity toward God, you may not feel like I never had anything against God. I was never angry at God. The yeah. Bible says that when we were separated from God, before we got saved, we were hostile toward God. We were hostile toward God because we did our own thing. We had our own ways to make up our own mind. We did our own decisions. We did what we wanted to do. And what we wanted to do wasn't what God wanted us to do, okay? So there was deep-seated stuff on the inside of us, you know? And some of us were ill will toward God and toward people because of our sin nature. The sin nature caused us to have these deep-seated feelings toward God. And that's why now that we're walking with him, we have such a depth of worship and love because we've been to those dark places and we know how dark it can be, okay? But hostility is a strong word because it's a word that has to do with acts of aggression and attacks. Acts of aggression and attacks. One of the things that God told me, and I wrote this down here, if you consider yourself the black sheep of the family, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, you will never be able to deal with wolves, you must get delivered today from feeling like the black sheep. Amen. You know what the black sheep does in a pack of, uh, uh, of sheep? The black sheep stands out. You can see the black sheep afar off. All the white ones blind in together. <laughs> they look like what? But the black sheep. Where did that stuff come from? The black sheep in the family. My sister, my sister used to feel like she was the black sheep. You know, I talk to people and say, well, I'm the black sheep in my family. I say right now, you're cursing yourself. Yeah. And, and let me say this. You could have been. They just didn't know who you were. Your mama could have referred to your brother. Maybe you had an extended family or blended family. Maybe you had some experiences that say they treated me different. And I don't think you're crazy. I think some of you that said you were treated different, you were treated different, and you know you were treated different. But today, as a child of God, you are no longer treated different. God puts you on the same level with everybody else and expects you to perform in faith like everybody else. So by the spirit of God's grace, you can no longer be a black sheep. God sent them out as sheep amongst the wolves. He says, you go out and you be fruitful and you tell them and you heal the sick and cast out devils and cleanse the lepers and raise the dead. And he knew, Jesus knew that there would be opposition. He knew that in this walk, once you got saved, that your, 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 your weakest moment, your, the area you're weakest in, whether it's in, 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 in booze or, or in drugs or, or sex or same sex and bisex and his sex and your sex and porn and, you know, all of that. And predator, Satan is a predator. And all of these areas of disguise that he is, is what predators use. So how does someone get a child? How does somebody woo a child away from her parents, okay, or from his parents? He acts like he's looking for a dog. He acts like he's gentle. He acts like he's kind. And because children are innocent, because they're innocent, and there's a difference between ignorant and innocence. Children are innocent. Some of y'all are just ignorant. These children are innocent, and so they draw them. And that's how they get them to the car. That's how they get them caught up in trafficking. That's how they exploit their sexuality. That's how they get them on, on boats and ships and crates and containers all over the world and sell them and take their organs and cut them up and chop them up and draw, do what they want to do with them because of their innocence. So God wants you to guard and protect your innocence, but not to be ignorant of spiritual things. He wants you to know that Satan loses at the end. And he wants you to know that he still thinks that he's God and that he teaches and that any of his prophecies or any prophecies, let me say this, strike that what I said. Any prophecies that come from a prophet supposedly of God, it has to correlate and come up with and be the level of who Jesus is. Because the, 
Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, okay? The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So none of these false prophets can do that. No one can say Jesus is Christ or Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. And so here, when we look at a transformation, to an angel of light, transform, okay? Let's look at your transformation. Let's look at my transformation. I'm out of time, almost. Look at my transformation, your transformation. It means that once you got born again, once you gave your life to God, something wonderful, powerful, beautiful happened on the inside of you. I mean, it was amazing. Everything on the outside looked the same, but not on the inside. Because God said, I'll take out that stony heart, and I'm going to put in another heart. I'll put a heart in that's pliable. I'm going to put a heart in that I can write my laws on the table of your hearts and give you the desire to want to fulfill these, these, uh, these, these acts of obedience, okay? Then something else happened, okay? A dramatic change because your tastes begin to change, and you're, you kind of didn't want to go out as much and do the kind of things that you kind of wanted to kind of change, okay? Uh, uh, then it began to affect your character. You know, he said, well, I just need to call and check her mom. I better pay so-and-so that $20 back. You know, then all these things that you have suppressed, now they're coming up and you think like, oh, these are things I need to do. Why? Because you're being transformed. Because there's a metamorphosis going on inside of you. There's something going on inside of you that's telling you that, no, my thought patterns are changing. See, if you're born again, your thought patterns change. So how do you know the true church from the apostate church? You know by their thought patterns, their behavior, and whether or not they've committed to to the mastery of the Word of God and the defense of the Word of God and the love of the Word of God and the worship of God. Other than that, you know, all of us, everybody say they're Christians. You know, I was looking for a few minutes at the uh, meeting the other day about what happened in, on uh, Capitol, Capitol uh, Hill on the 6th of January, you know, and everyone, uh, it, it, everyone is a Christian. This is a Christian nation. You know, patriotism is a new cult. You got to watch yourself. You know, the, no, no, all you guys in the military. I'm not saying that about all of you that have served in the military. I don't mean that about you. I mean, there's an ideology because it's been disguised and manipulated that have people thinking that the new patriotism is somehow linked to a political party, and it's not. See, so we have to be able to discern and 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 change and modify our behavior because we've been converted. We're now ambassadors for Christ. Speaking of ambassadors, there were some men that came to Joshua. Joshua in the promised land. They were going on and on. They were just taking the promised land by storm. Taking it by storm. And these people came up called the Gibeonites who looked like they, they said they were ambassadors, but they weren't. But they heard about uh, uh, the God of Joshua. They heard about the God of Israel. They heard about it. So they came. And these people were part of the promised land. They were wealthy. They had cars, clothes. I was going to say cars. They had clothes and shoes and this and the other. But they took all their new stuff, took all their new stuff off, and they put on all this old stuff, old shoes and wrapped their feet like they had been walking for miles and old garments and, and they, they sewed up their wine bags trying to look like they were all beat up and old and, and they wanted to look old and, and poor and rugged and homeless. And they came to Joshua and they said, and they said uh, we've heard of your God. We want you to get in covenant with us and, and get in the league with us. And then if you just look on their outward appearance, would Joshua say, well, yeah, these people don't have nothing. They don't have nothing. Let me, let me get, get in agreement. Let me help them. Okay. And they kept on asking and asking. So finally, Joshua went ahead and agreed. Didn't inquire of God, but went ahead and agreed to get in league with the Gibeonites. And got in league with the Gibeonites and later on found out that they had been beguiled. That's why I don't give to every homeless person. I give. And I give what God tells me to give. I don't give to every homeless person. I don't, you know, but I give. You got to be aware. They show sometime with the people standing up asking for money on the street. Now, mind you, alms is a part of Islam's religion. So the giving alms and asking for alms, that's all part of, of Islam. But you look at some people, and they're standing at the corner. They want you to give them money. They don't have no gas. don't have no this, have no money. And then you know you've seen the reporters follow them to their car. They get in an SUV. They change their jacket, and then they drive off. <laughs> now, if you gave, 
that's between you and God because you're a giver. Don't ever feel bad. I've been played like that too. They said, well, you know, I gave them some money. They didn't really need it. Somebody gave them the money. They went to buy liquor. Gave them the money. They didn't buy a burger. Bought a burger. They didn't want a burger. You can buy them something. Well, anyway, you put, they put cheese on it. I didn't want cheese on it. I didn't want fries. I didn't want something. That. I don't want that. I don't want that. I don't want that. <laughs> so, so, so sometimes you say, whoa, okay, all right. He just wanted money. What do you want some money for? I want some money to buy some booze. So what's to do this? So, but the Gibeonites deceived Joshua because of their outward appearance. They look like they had nothing, you know. Some people look like they have nothing. Then you got the other extreme that believe in fake it till you make it. And they look like they have everything and they don't have a pot till you know what it is. They ain't got a dime. You know, they can't, their credit cards are all maxed out, you know, but they got on the latest garments. I, they got on signature this, signature shoes. You know, mother's gone buy $200 for tennis shoes. Uh, you can't call them tennis for shoes. And, you know, that time you got a Mercedes, you don't have a garage to park it in, you got to park it on the street. <laughs> Outward appearance. Outward appearance. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And so transformation, we transform by the renewing of our minds so that we can escalate and elevate and discern and walk in an understanding because our minds are no longer blinded. He has blinded them. So we got to pray for people whose eyes have been blinded by the God of this world that they may not, that they may not see the light of the glorious gospel. That is our assignment, that we pray that they see the light of the glorious gospel. But meantime, you got to discern the angel of light. I believe it was an angel of light, Maroni, that appeared to, to uh, Joseph Smith. I believe it was an angel of light that appeared to Taz Russell, Jehovah's Witnesses. I believe it was an angel of light, an angel of light, an angel of light, appeared to all these different religions, uh, an angel of light, and gave them a philosophy and an ideology that opposes Christ, but is close enough to Christ that people would think that it's all the same. Why? Because Satan thinks he's God. And that's the depth of Satan, to convince you that he's God. Oh, I'm done. I'm not really done. <laughs> I'm not really done. But I'm done for now. How many of you get this message today? Do not. And then and, 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 and the church is like, we don't get it. You got to get it, church. So God told me, he said, preach it anyhow. Just preach it anyhow. Because I'm going to have to stand before God behind what I preach. I have to stand before God behind what I tell you. I have to tan before God, and I'm not going to be in a place where I water down because I think the people won't understand. If somebody will get it, somebody will catch it. We got a prophetic house here. We got prophets in this room, and and so therefore we're not going to let the devil disguise anything. You know, I want you to recognize evil for evil. The Bible says, "Woe to them that call evil good and good evil, evil good and good evil." And some of the things that have happened to you. I heard a writer put it like this. He said, I believe in the 50-20 principle. What is the 50-20 principle? The 50-20 principle comes from Genesis 50, verse 20. And that is, as Joseph's family had done him wrong, and Joseph's family threw him into the pit and abandoned him, left him for dead. And then you know he was found. And he went through a lot before he became the leader under Pharaoh of the nation of Egypt. But he was able at one time to say to his family that had done him wrong, to look them in the face and say, you meant it for evil, but God used it for my good. You meant it for evil, but God used it for my good. And when you could get to the point in your elevation and your understanding of Scripture and understanding of the voice of God, that sometimes people do mean evil towards you, but God's going to use it for your good. Embrace 5020. You meant it for evil, but God's how many of you today? You meant it for evil. Lift both hands. Let one for evil, one for good. You meant it for evil, but God's going to what? He's going to use it for my good. Say he's using it for my good. So that means you can let it go. He's using it for my good. So you can let it go. I said, he's using it for your good. I said, so you can let it go. I said, he's using it. He's using it. He's using it. You can let it go. Nothing, 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 nothing will deceive you. Holiness. Holiness. Stay 
where you know you're safe. Walking in holiness is what you need in Jesus' name. How many of you had evil done to you before? Lift your hand. Look around the room. And look and see how we're still here. Look, look. Not just are we still here. We still trust God. We still read the Bible. We still worship. We still love the Lord. We've been wronged by people. And some of these people were deceived. We were wronged by them. But, but we're still here. And you're learning how to love past hurt and pain. And people who were fakes and fronts and wearing these masks and disguises that never intended you good in the first place. God said, even then, I'm going to use it to help you. I'm going to use it to bless you. I'm going to use it to wake, your, wake you up. I'm going to use it so you'll understand. Next time you'll know, you'll be able to discern the angel of life. You'll be able to discern a pimp. You'll be able to discern someone that is manipulating or got some type of financial plan or deal to make you rich overnight. You understand before you sign a piece of paper, signing your house away, are you willing to go get a hard money loan for 40%? Wait on God. You don't have to get a hard money loan. God's talking to someone. I know you're in dire straits, but a hard money loan is not going to get you out because you can't afford the payment on a hard money loan. It may get your house out seemingly, but your payment is going to quadruple. And you could possibly, and I'm going to say possibly because I don't want to decree it, you could possibly still end up losing it because you can't make the payments on a hard money loan. And even though it's legal, it's predatory. It's predatory. And it looks like a gift, but it's not. It looks like it's an answer to prayer, but it's not. It looks like it's an angel of light, but it's not. It's a predator. And the end result would be to harm you and to hurt you, destroy you, to rob you, till you lose your mind and just want to check out of here because you were taken advantage of. So Father, seal the reality of your word and truth to the lives of your people, to the hearts of your people, that we understand that we have a covenant with you. And that covenant demands our attention, our attention to study, to read and pray, and to worship in the name of Jesus. That our minds be not corrupted and removed from the simplicity of the gospel. That we walk in a place in our homes and our families and we put the work in for our families and our homes and our ministries. We put in the work that we're not led astray by underhandedness. We put in the work that we know the word, that no, nobody can come and use trickery and, and capture our imagination to such degree. In the name of Jesus, whether it's physical imagination, soulish imagination, or physical, spiritual, either way, that they cannot do that. I pray for recovery from pornography in the name of Jesus that opened the mind up to a distorted and corrupt imagination that distorts the imagination and makes it almost impossible to get revelation from God because of the fantasies that have clouded your mind for so many years has charmed you and, and swindled you out of the right to be called a child of God have captured, captured you and deceived but the blood of Jesus the blood of Jesus and also the transformation of the power of the Holy Spirit that you can walk. You can take the mask off of your face and when you smile, your smile is for real. 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 Some of us have learned how to hide our pain beyond a smile. But when you walk in wholeness, you walk in holiness you'll be all right I remember my son that's gone to heaven he would say this sometime when we would be fellowshipping he said don't push me because I'm too close to the edge I'm trying not to lose my head I can't do the ha 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 uh-huh. It's like a jungle, and I'm telling you, it's like a jungle sometimes. 
it makes me wonder how I keep from going under. Don't push me. And that's what the devil's trying to do to some of you. Trying to push you to the edge so you'll fall. Fall back into the jungle and the mire and the mess of money, mammon, greed, drugs, alcohol, perversion. You're right on the edge. You're right on the edge. Step back, my child. God said, I got you. I got you. And he's saying, that's what I was telling the disciples. It's like a jungle out there. It's like a jungle. Like a jungle. Me and the men were talking yesterday about an anaconda. I don't like talking about snakes, especially anaconda. But God told me that about the dragon. It's a big, scaly serpent. And that's one of Satan's names. Try to constrict you and rob you. But what he uses is not physical. Your weapons are spiritual. And what you use can no one take from you. Lord, seal this. Hold that person is on the edge, the edge of going back, and on the edge of falling into something that they that you've delivered them from. About to take a drink that they know that they shouldn't take. About to take a hit. I come against the depression. The depression. Too close to the edge. Too close to the edge. If you're too close to the edge, I want you to stand up right now. If you're too close to the edge. Anybody here? Anybody close to the edge? If you're in your home, wherever you are, if you're close to the edge, I want you to stand wherever you are. Stand. Hard out of soul. Quarter didn't they say my shallow didn't they? Close to the edge. Close to the edge. Close to the edge. Come on down here. Give me a chair. Give me a chair real quick. Come on down. Let me pray for you. Too close to the edge. Too close to the edge. Deception. It's nothing but deception. 